Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. My name is Karen Savell, and I'm the CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Fairfield County, and we are thrilled to be partnering with the Westport Library tonight on what is going to be a fantastic program. I have the honor tonight of making some introductions, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about The American Way, A True Story of Nazi Escape, Superman, and Marilyn Monroe, because this book, the audio portion of this book, was recorded right here at Westport Library. So be sure to take stock of that. Um, up here tonight at the conversation, let me introduce Helene Stepinski. She is the nationally best-selling author of three memoirs, Five Finger Discount, Murder in Matera, and Baby Plays Around. She writes regularly for the New York Times. Her work has also appeared in the Washington Post, New York, and Travel and Leisure, and dozens of other publications. She teaches at New York University, and she lives in Brooklyn. We got one applause, perfect. <laughs> Bonnie Siegler is the founder and creative director of the award-winning multidisciplinary graphic design studio Eight and a Half, the author of Dear Client, a guide for people who work with creatives and signs of resistance, a visual history of protest in America. She taught design in the graduate schools of Yale University and the School of Visual Arts for many years. And finally, David Pogue. He is the New York Times weekly tech columnist and is a six-time Emmy winner for his stories on CBS Morning Morning, a New York Times best-selling author and a five-time TED Talk host of 20 Nova Science Specials on PBS and creator host of the CBS News Simon & Schuster podcast, Unsung Science. Please welcome our guest speakers tonight. That would be CBS Sunday morning. Well, hello, everybody. Hello, Bonnie and Helene. Hello. hello. Thank you for coming. I understand this is the end of your marketing push of book talks. It's the end of our spring tour. <laughs> oh! <laughs> we'll be there's, back in the fall. There's a summer one and a, a fall one? So we're taking the summer off, but there is a fall one. I see. Um, and I should point out that I signed on to do this uh, without having read the book, without knowing what, what the book was about, uh, because Bonnie's son and my son are best friends at Staples, <laughs> and they have just graduated. Um, so, so all right. First of all, what what is the elevator pitch? I mean, when I when I read the cover, the blurb, it says something about you found this footage of Marilyn Monroe's famous footage over the subway grate, as though that's the starting off point. But that that doesn't actually happen until page two hundred and ninety, at the end of the book. Well, that was sort of the thing that started everything, although with a big time delay, because I found the footage in like 2006, and I didn't decide to do anything with it until 2016. So it was the start for me, but I found the footage, I put it away, I was like, this is amazing. I put it away, and then about seven years later, I was like, you know what, I want to get an article in the New York Times about this and about my grandfather, because Times were changing, and there was a lot of hate and animosity towards others, a lot of anti-Semitism, and it seemed like we needed a story about the Holocaust in the New York Times. So I asked a friend if they knew anyone, and they introduced me to Helene. <laughs> wait, what? You just, wait, so it you went, started... You just went from, I found film of Marilyn Monroe... Sorry. ...to, there needs to be more writing about the Holocaust. What? So I... <laughs> Well, let me pick it up from there. So her grandfather shot the footage of Marilyn Monroe, but her grandfather also escaped from Nazi Germany in 1938. So that's the bigger story. Marilyn is the MacGuffin, you know. So it's when a Trojan she, horse. Yeah, the Trojan horse. When she showed me the footage of Marilyn, you know, on her phone when I first met her, I was like, wow, this is amazing. But then when she told me about her grandfather, I said, oh, that's the story. You know, I have the nose for news, you know, I write for the Times. And um, so I pitched the story about her grandfather and about Marilyn, and um, they took it. And it was a great, you know, a great story. And just to, in itself, never mind me writing it, it was just, itself was a great story. And it was one of those stories that went viral, you know. They had the footage of Marilyn at the top of the home page. You know, everybody saw it that Sunday. Um, it was right after Trump was inaugurated. I think people were looking for something light. You know, there had been only Trump coverage for many, many months. And uh, it was just one of those stories that went around the planet and back again. And um, so after it ran, well, we'll talk about that. Should we get to that later? Wait, so, yeah. so there, you actually... So we did get an article in the New York Times 
and about that Marilyn and the Holocaust. Just Marilyn yeah. oh, okay. and yes, my both. grandfather's yes. escape. That's okay. that's yeah. what it was. Got it. So years, a few years went by, and we discovered a third piece to add to the story, and that was Harry Donenfeld and Superman Comics. Harry Donenfeld was the publisher of Superman Comics, and he also happened to sign for my family to come over from Germany in 1938. So the Donenfeld, Harry Donenfeld saved my family, and I have to say, there's a bunch of Donenfeld grandchildren here tonight. Because they're from Westport. Wow. <laughs> Harry well, don't Donenfeld. Don't applaud, don't applaud. I mean, is, am I wrong that Harry Donenfeld is the villain of the piece? He no. does not come no, out no, well. No, no, no. He's not the villain. No, he saved her grandfather. Oh my God, he cheats. He, he <laughs> cheats on his wife. He cheats on his mistresses. He swindles the creators of, of Superman out of millions. Like, he signs their rights away when they're 20 something. Well, he was a complicated character. Yeah. But he was, but he, he was nice he's kind of a hero of the story. I mean, he, he's. I know. He, Once the grandchildren leave, we'll tell the real story. Okay. <laughs> um, no, he was a he was a he was a complicated character who did a lot of things that were maybe seemingly against the law. The he, mafia he a, were his friends. He was a bootlegger. You said that. He was a bootlegger. But he was also a mensch who saved my family. <laughs> oh, I see. So the the needs of the few. <laughs> oh, okay. So, all right. So yeah. So you're, you the the book is in chapters and it's jumping from story to story. And to me, honestly, I don't know if anyone's said this to you, but what kept me going through it is the mystery of who the hell is Jules. So your characters are the guys who created Superman, her to them, uh, Marilyn Monroe, her to her, um, you know, Clark Gable, Arthur Miller, and on and on, heard of all these people. And then this guy Jules comes back, who's a nobody, forgive me. No, no, he's the everyman. He represents he's the, the everyman. everyman. Okay, he's okay. us in the story, just a guy. I see. He was a furrier also, just because everyone assumes he was a he a was filmmaker. a cinematographer because yeah. he had a camera with him, but he was a furrier with a 16 millimeter camera. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that I think almost everyone winds up intersecting everyone else. Yes. Including, yes. to my astonishment, Harry, the a-hole antagonist of the piece. <laughs> Stop it. You're like a dog who's been hit. You're like, eh. <laughs> All right, Harry, the complicated womanizing cheat with mafia ties. <laughs> Am I wrong? Keep going. <laughs> Go on, and Harry. And Jules, the everyman who gets out of right. Berlin and escapes the Holocaust. Like, and Marilyn, I'll Marilyn ties in with Harry, right? And Marilyn ties in with Harry. Did, oh, and of course, Jules ties in with Harry. Right. That's the whole Obviously, book, right. book jacket. Yeah, right. yeah. So what is the connection between Harry and Jules? Well, my grandfather had a cousin who he didn't know. He came to America to find a sponsor, leaving my mother and my grandmother in Germany. And this cousin had lived next door to Harry in the Bronx before he, Superman, in the early 30s. And they had remained friends. So when my grandfather came to New York, she went to Harry. It happened to be the week the very first issue of Superman was coming out, Action Comics number one. And she got him to sign for my family. Oh, porn. The other thing Harry published, porn. Just it was girly to, magazines. To complete girly the list. Magazines. Yeah. Yeah, porn in the 30s wasn't really porn. It <laughs> was really true. drawings of girls. <laughs> With no top. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, okay, so sooner or later, everybody intersects with everybody, and that to me is, is the payoff at the end. Still wondering who the hell is Jules, and then like, and had a granddaughter named Bonnie, and I'm like, got it. Her name's on the cover. Now you know why. So was, first of all, how did Helene get involved with your story? So when, when I decided that we needed to put an article in the New York Times, I asked my book agent at the time, and she said, I know the perfect person. This never works out when someone says that. <laughs> we went out to lunch, <laughs> fell in love, and then like just kept working together for the next five years. Working together how? How did this work? Because writing is such a solitary Helene act. Helene is the imagine. writer. I'm the yeah. writer. She's yeah. the writer. Did I did the adverbs. The... She did the noun. No, no. She did a lot I did of research. The research. <laughs> a lot of, especially the family research. I mean, she... and I would just feed Helene. Here's a story about Jerry and Joe. Here's a story about you know Arthur Miller. Here's a story about Helene. About. 
<laughs> you have stories about me. I, I miss that. Stories and about she, you. She just kept shoveling stuff my way. And at, at some points, I was just like, Bonnie, stop, because I, I can't keep it together. You know, you're <laughs> freaking me out. I have too much information. And so she would just keep shoveling it, and I would try and put it in the right place and, you know, massage it and get it to where it needed to be. That's how the Nazi Titanic didn't end up in the book. <laughs> the Nazi Titanic was Please one don't of the talk things she wrote. That's a whole other story. You don't want to know about that. Go. But, um, yeah, you know, but it was a great... A collaboration because she didn't want to write. I don't, I don't think I could have written a book with someone else. I've never even written a story with someone else. So writing a, write, actually writing sentences with someone else, I don't think would happen for me. That's yeah. not, no. no. I'm so mostly alone. writing, mostly research. Yeah. I see. Yeah, I did research too, but, and then I would throw everything back to her and she would read through it. And All right, so, it. so getting back to my original question then, what is this book? Is it, is it historical fiction? No, is there's it, no fiction in it. It's memoir, biography, crazy-ass story. <laughs> <laughs> memoir, biography. Um, because I kept thinking, I mean, it's written like fiction. You've got quotations. You've got what they were wearing. You said you have what their reactions were. You have what the weather was like. This was hundreds of years ago. How would you know? <laughs> well, there's a few things. One, I have a, a lot of movies and photographs. And I also got a huge pile of documents from Germany describing everything in the apartment, that they had to leave, all sorts of things, all their documents back and forth. So we did, and my grandfather lived to be 93, and he was a talker. Oh. So she the, knew all the stories. So he was the guy who always got up to tell stories, no matter what. Even if it was four people at a diner, he'd stand up and tell his stories. Um, so, yeah, I knew the stories really well. But we also went to Berlin. We spent time in Berlin reporting. We went to what? all the places. Sorry, say that again. We went to Berlin and went to all the places where he lived and worked. Oh. And on the ground really reporting. We all... interviewed everybody in the family, everyone, multiple times. We interviewed everyone in the Donenfeld family multiple times. And even uh, relatives I didn't know I had, I met and interviewed. Wow. <laughs> so it's not made up. It's <laughs> None of it is made up. And in Berlin, all the buildings that my grandfather's store was in, his home, all of them, all, my cousin's store, um, all those buildings were still standing. And if you've been to Berlin, you know how many buildings aren't there not anymore. Standing. Yeah. So it was really miraculous. Wow. But how do you know, you know, he put his hand on her shoulder and said, I escaped the Holocaust. I mean, how do you know? Well, there were stories he told, like I said, over and over, like the Clark Gable story. But other story. people, how do you know what Harry said? And I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we talked to people. Oh, you talked to the descendants. That's that Harry guy. Jr. The guy with the beard. Have yeah. you guys cleaned Harry. up your act? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so not historical fiction, but historical nonfiction. Nonfiction, yeah. I've invented we call it term. creative nonfiction. It, 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 creative actually, nonfiction, there we go. It is a historical nonfiction is a term. What's that? It is a term, oh, historical nonfiction. I yeah. didn't coin that? No, oh. sorry. <laughs> okay, thought I might make my fortune that way. All right, so was it ever a discussion of whether this was more books than one? Was it ever a discussion, we should write a book about my grandfather and his journey and you know the, your, your whole family was tied up in the Holocaust. Um, like what made you think, oh, we should bring in famous people uh, concurrently to... Well, I think the famous people were the draw. You know, I think a, a lot of people, if you tell them you're writing a Holocaust book, if you publish a Holocaust book, they kind of run in the other direction. People aren't going to read a Holocaust book for the most part. And um, this... So, Helene, I'm so sorry. I can't understand you. Could you... Really? Maybe move it just a little okay. bit back, or maybe there's... Can no you guys monitors. hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, they can okay. hear you because they've okay. got the speakers, but I'm okay. hearing nothing got but it. the echo. Okay. Sorry, say that again. Um, I think, you know, we wanted to sort of write a Holocaust book that the general public would read. And I think that's where Marilyn comes in, that's where Superman comes in. So people who would normally not pick up a book about the Holocaust, people who've never even met a Jew, not will actually Jews. read a book about the Holocaust. We just came back from the Superman convention in Metropolis, Illinois. <laughs> and, you know, people there, I could guarantee, have never read a book about the Holocaust. <laughs> and we sold 50 books, you know? so. This is their education about the Holocaust. Basically, basically, Superman and Marilyn, it's like we said, it's like a Trojan horse. So we, we get you in, and it looks appealing, and then you come upon the Holocaust in the middle of the book. But it's also not so 
it's an, actually an uplifting book because every time it gets a little dark, it switches to talk about Marilyn or Superman. <laughs> and it actually does have a happy ending, so. You're manipulating our feelings? And we yes. are. Okay. That's what okay. we do as writers. Yeah. Um, so the Superman element, uh, as a boy from Cleveland, oh, right. um, I know Jerry and Joe's story very well, um, and it's really a, a horrifying story. So basically, these guys created Superman, and this jerk Harry, oh uh, no, perfectly legal document, right? They signed going in. Yeah. It said, I give Harry all future rights. They couldn't foresee the Marvel movie empire or anything, but they signed him the rights. So when the TV show came out, Harry got the money. When the movies came out, Harry got the money. When it became a huge hit in comic book form, Harry got the money. And, the, and these two guys spent the rest of their lives trying to sue him, right? And every yeah. judge just threw it out. It was like, dudes, you signed a contract. Right. They did work for Harry for a long time. And yeah, they did yeah. make a lot of money. I mean, they kind of pissed away their money, but that's a whole other story. They didn't Which, know what they had they or what, what they, they were, were doing. doing. Yeah. They didn't know anything. Right. And Harry and Jack took advantage of that fact. Yeah. They were also, Jerry was a little annoying. Um, <laughs> just even in the letters back and forth. I mean, he wrote angry letters all the time. So just, you know, I only have twenty thousand. I only have nineteen thousand eight hundred dollars in my bank account. Can you send me two hundred dollars so it's an even twenty thousand? <laughs> Things like that. He was definitely annoyed. Doesn't forgive what they did, but I'm just saying. It doesn't it doesn't forgive what who did. In other words, what, I want to know where you guys stand on this. They they signed a legal contract. Nobody knew it was going to be a mega hit. It's complicated. <laughs> It is. I mean, Harry, uh, Jerry met a guy in, in when he was in the army, a lawyer, who said, oh, I can totally take care of this for you. You're going to get Superboy back because DC Comics had stolen Superboy, and we're going to get you the rights for Superman. He was also working with Harry and Jack Leibowitz's lawyer. So they were screwed. Wherever they went, they were screwed and taken advantage of, these two guys. It was really sad. And then, 30 years later, the Superman movie comes out, and the public starts screaming at Warner Brothers, how can you treat these people this way? And they got a certain amount of money every year. 30,000 bucks. And then they also got their name on every Superman publication or movie or TV show. So it always now says, created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. And then they died. And then they died. <laughs> <laughs> Along with, I mean, those last couple chapters, you guys. I mean, it's, everybody dies. Everybody. It well, works does like that. Die in general. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story of life. Yes. <laughs> um, so the okay. So then there's the uh, the Marilyn Monroe moment. So she's filming this movie. T tell us the story. So she, Marilyn is filming the Seven Year Itch in New York, and it happens to be my grandfather lived on Lexington between 61st and 62nd, and they were filming on 61st between Lex and Third in a townhouse. So he went out during the day and with his movie camera and filmed her outside of the townhouse. If anyone has seen the Seven Year Itch, it's a terrible movie. I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, but so he filmed her, and a guy there said, "Oh, you know what? Tomorrow night we're filming on Lexington, you know, down a few blocks." So he went out at one in the morning with his movie camera, and stood right behind the camera, right behind Billy Wilder, and filmed her. I mean, he's like five feet away, and it's just exquisite because it's between takes. It's the skirt going up over her head, and apparently that night Joe DiMaggio was so horrified seeing Marilyn's skirt go over her head that that night he he beat her up. And the next day, she left him. He, he was her husband, we should point out. Yeah. Yes, she was married to him at the time. So they reshot the scene in LA. And so the footage my grandfather has, or now I have, is the only footage of that, of that shoot. And you can see part of the footage online if you go to the Times. Yeah, let's, let's roll the clip. Up. Can we roll the clip? <laughs> We're not rolling it. You, you can bring the clip? <laughs> oh, come on. It's the cornerstone of the book. Um, OK. so. And, and the other part that uh, I thought was rather shocking was that Joe DiMaggio made the producers discard the famous footage. I, we don't know. I mean, Billy Wilder never said what he did with it. It could uh, be hiding somewhere. I think it's going to turn up eventually. I think. It's oh, yeah. So what is what is in the footage that we can't see? Well, you can, like I said, like Helene said, <laughs> like I said, whatever. Is it on YouTube? Uh, it's on the New York Times site. If you oh. if you. Um, I think it was called The Lost Footage of Marilyn Monroe. So if you Google it on the New York Times, you can see some of the footage. And what does it 
show? Is it it's gaffers and best boys and no. cameramen? No, no, no. It's, it's just her Marilyn. Under, her underwear, basically. <laughs> And Tom Yule, the guy who starred with her, and she's pushing him into place, and she's arranging herself, and she's, it's really intense. And the skirt goes completely over her head. Yeah. It's really crazy. It's not like the movie. I mean, the movie is like very movie. tame, yeah. you know. Yeah, the movie just shows it. her ankles. Yeah. <laughs> and th and th that, that's from the footage. So oh, that's, that's from your... Yeah, that's how close and, he oh, was. Okay. Wow. Um, and it, it turns out that this was not intended to be this iconic central point of the movie, central point of American culture. It just became a craze in New York well, City. Well, they had, they, had um, they invited a lot of photographers. They invited pretty much every photographer to the shoot. So they knew, they were doing it as a publicity stunt. You know? Oh. Some people think they didn't even plan on using that footage. Oh, really? You know? Yeah, that it was just for a publicity stunt. Because that photo that you all know of her dress blowing up is from the original shoot. So that went out on all the wires, you know, that was that went all over the world. So it was really a publicity stunt. And, and I was surprised to find out that Billy Wilder himself is not American. He escaped from Berlin as well. He escaped from Berlin also. So his story and Jules's story are very parallel. And the, the plot goes back and forth between them and Harry and Marilyn. And, so is it and really Billy Wilder? <laughs> like, is that what they oh, would Oh, Wilder, called? yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 Yeah, because they and, say W's like V's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he he started out with his name B I L L I E, but then when he moved to America, he found out that that was a girl's spelling, and so he changed it to B I L L Y. Yeah. Yeah, and tell the younger folks why Billy Wilder is famous. He's a great director. Yeah, he's a film director. <laughs> <laughs> what what were some of his famous movies? He did Sunset Boulevard. Some like it hot. Um, seven year itch. Seven year itch. He's done all kinds of stuff. Google him. <laughs> <laughs> He's amazing. He's one of my favorite directors. He's Were there at any time any other characters in this stew of contemporaries that you thought this would be good and later didn't use? I think we stuck everybody in there. Yeah. We shoved them all in. We've got Clark Gable. <laughs> Margaret you know, Sanger Clark. is in there. <laughs> Margaret Sanger, yeah. Um, um, because that was another good thing Harry did, now that I'm the Harry apologist. Um, <laughs> he printed Margaret Sanger's birth control materials when no one else would. They called, the printers called it a sing-sing job because you would go to jail if you printed birth control material, but Harry printed it. Wow, this guy's redeeming himself before our eyes. <laughs> um, so I guess, I mean, he sounds like a complicated guy. Somebody should write a book. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Done. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the Holocaust plays a big role. Um, and here again, you have details from within the walls of these concentration camps, stories of torture and brutal immersion in cold water and, uh, you know, the horrific that is just so specific that again, I wonder where this came from. I can tell you exactly where it came from. So we, we found some tapes of her relatives who were there are, in the Holocaust. People made Showa, you know, Showa tapes where they tell their story in the Holocaust so that nobody ever forgets. But on top of that, I interviewed Holocaust survivors who were in the same camps at the exact same time. Wow! So I have my stu I'm a teacher and I have my students interview Holocaust survivors. That's what they do for their final project. Oh, I see. They do an interview. So I've met you know, dozens of, of Holocaust survivors. So I did that. I also went through the uh, Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York City and the Holocaust Museum in DC, and they just have dozens and dozens and dozens of testimonies. And so I, I found the ones that corresponded to where people were at the exact same time. And so. people told incredibly detailed stories. I mean, they said, they it's remembered everything. Yeah. Right. So Wow. It sounds like there was a lot of research involved in this book. There was a lot. There was. <laughs> A couple of years. Yeah. It was during so, COVID, so, you know. What was that? It was, it was during our, COVID, so we didn't have anything else happening. You know, oh. It was our COVID project. <laughs> but it, that was just a coincidence. We decided to write the book in January, and COVID happened in March, so. Oh, wow. So we the book was already out. underway. Yes. And then what has the book writing journey been like? I mean, I've, I know what my book journeys have been like, but, you know, you have an editor, and sometimes the editor has suggestions that you don't like. You have marketing people. You have a cover designer. You're a graphic designer. Uh, I'm the cover designer. She, you are the cover designer. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't have a fight with the cover designer. I didn't, not one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got along so well. <laughs> so, so, yeah, what was that 
process like? Did you go chapter by chapter that you turned in? No, I, this is my fourth book, so I'm an old hand. So I wrote the book and then gave it to the editor. And she said you could send it to me in installments, but I, I know where I'm going. And if I need help, I'll ask, you know, but I didn't. And so I just kept going and then handed her a rough draft, if you will. And, um, you know, she, she did a great at it. She was really, really smart, but young, but very smart. Really good comments and yeah. nothing that we really disagreed with. Yeah. So wow. It was yeah. very smooth. Yeah. You, you lucked out. We did. But we, we were on the same page. I mean, she, you know, at one point, like uh, Bonnie was saying, you know, you've got the stuff about the Holocaust. And I wanted to, um, you know, cut to the other information while we're talking about the Holocaust, it's not just like nine chapters about the Holocaust and you're gonna put the book down and walk away. You know what I mean? So there was one point, point where it got really, really dark and I said, I was in the middle of the night, I woke up and I said, you know what, we should put a chapter in here about Billy Wilder's movie that he made about World War II. And so right in the middle of that darkest part, we cut to that. And so... It's called what, Five Graves to Cairo. Five Graves to Cairo, yeah. And so I added it, and the, the, the editor had already seen the rough draft, and then I added it in, in another edit. And she's like, she called me, she's like, oh my God, that was just a great idea. You know, I was thinking it was a little too heavy there, and you, you really, and, it, and it's, it's seamless because it's about World War II, the movie, so it's not like, you know, right. you're talking about Mickey Mouse in the middle of, like, the Holocaust. But, Superman, um, we're just talking about Superman in the middle of the yeah, Holocaust. Yeah, well, but Superman was fighting World War II, you know, and he was fighting Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini before we were. You know, so he was back there, in 39. He was, was in the comics. He's yes. fighting real world people. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. He fought the Nazis. Yeah, before we did. Harry was a socialist also. And he came out against, yeah, Hitler and Mussolini. Oh, Superman's always holding them by the scruff of their necks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they were Jewish. You know, the guys who ran all the comics um, were Jews because they couldn't get jobs in the regular publishing world. And so they created comics, just much like they created Hollywood. And um, so they had relatives in Europe who were being tortured by the Nazis, you know, in 38, 39. They already knew what was going on. And so they were ahead of the game, you know. Obviously, FDR knew too. That's a whole other story. But, and they, and they, um, weren't, they weren't shy about talking about it yeah. like everybody else in America was. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I wonder what would happen today if Superman or... Took on Putin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Maybe he does. Putin's I don't know. Putin's a little bit people know? Cut, I don't even but, <laughs> right. you know, so was Hitler. <laughs> put, put substitute something more controversial. You know, like what if su Superman took a stance on abortion or gun right. control? Right. Like, I, think it's, I think it's harder these days. Maybe he does, though. Do, do people read Superman now? Do we know? I don't. He's still fighting the good fight. Is he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Did he always have all the powers that he has? Like it seems no, to me they no, they, they grew. Stuff they up, they like grew. X-ray vision, he super breath. He I mean, couldn't he fly. Couldn't right fly. Right away. Yeah. He, that's why he he couldn't he, fly. He no, he leap. He, he would leap tall buildings. Oh, in right. a single wow. bound. And then when they were doing when Fleischer was doing the cartoons, they were like, we can't have him leaping all over the place. <laughs> he has to fly for God's sake. And then they made the whoosh, the sound, you know. Wow. And what's really hilarious slash pathetic is that Joe and Jerry, the kids who created Superman and then lost the rights, spent decades trying to recreate their success by creating <laughs> these other absolutely doofy sounding superhero names. Yeah. Funny, 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 funny man. man. Funny what man. is it? Funny man. Funny man? Which I think was pretty unfunny, and it yeah. didn't fly. Wow. Obviously. One of my favorite things, though, was Joe drew the cape. You know, the, he, the reason Superman has a cape is because that's how you can show motion in a static character. If he didn't have the cape, he would just be a guy who's still. But with the cape blowing behind him, you could tell he was flying. Oh, yeah. And so what is the story with Super? Boy, they did get the rights? Yeah, they, they had pitched it, and it was rejected by DC. And then when Jerry was in DC the army. Is Harry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And Jack Leibowitz. Yeah. Who was worse than Harry? <laughs> <laughs> Says Any everybody. grandchildren of Jack? For, no, I don't think they would come. We don't treat him very well in the book. Um, yeah, so what were we saying? Oh, so they. Uh, what were we saying? What, 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 was, <laughs> what were we? Oh, oh sorry. sorry. <laughs> lost the uh, yeah, oh, so the question. Uh, he was in the army. Jerry oh, was in yeah, the yeah, army. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. And Joe sent him. Super they boy. made him draw Superboy. They made Joe draw Superboy, even though he knew it was their idea. They pitched so, it. So Jerry was away and He's not in part the of army. This. Yeah. 
Oh. So he won that lawsuit. They won well, that lawsuit. Well, then they came back, and the guy, the lawyer he met in the Army, said, we, we got this, we got this. But really, the lawyer ended up with more money than Jerry and Joe. And you guys called the signing of that original contract uh, the original sin of comics. Right. Not, it's, that's what it's considered. What everybody calls yeah. it. Is it. Does that imply that subsequent artists did not make the same mistake? Correct. Bob yeah. Kane is the main, Bob Kane who Batman. Cr created Batman. Yes. He specifically was like, I'm not making that mistake. And so he owned the rights. Although he did screw over the guy who drew it with him. He didn't acknowledge Bill Finger. The, oh, the writer. Okay. Yes, so it went on at different levels in different ways, but Bob Kane completely credits Jerry and Joe with his wealth. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm really torn about this. I, I would have been a seventh generation lawyer had I not become the black sheep and become a Broadway conductor. <laughs> um, so law is in my family, and when you are young and starving, and they say, sign away the rights and we'll give you hundreds of dollars that you really need, it was more that's the deal that you signed. But also, they had been trying to sell Superman for five years. It was rejected over and over. People said the characters were immature, the drawing style was stiff. It was just kept being rejected. And these guys wanted to buy it and print it. Yeah. And it was the going rate, what and they got. That was it was what, normal. It was $10 a page, you know. So that was what people got. So yeah. for, for the comic, but yeah, not for right. the, the right merchandising forever. and all that stuff came yeah. later, you know. It reminds me a little bit of the musical A Chorus Line. So A Chorus Line is based on the actual lives of this group of young actors and dancers uh, who Bob Fosse and the writers spent weeks with in an apartment getting their life stories, and, you know, you each get 1,500 bucks for, for telling us your life stories. Right. Here's the contract. Sign it. Sure. <laughs> and then the thing makes billions of dollars, and then right. they sue because you, you screwed us. Did they screw them? They signed the deal knowing, right. I don't know, it's Yeah, no, it's the American way. It's the American way. <laughs> Which That's is why it's the called book. the American way. It's after Superman's motto, truth, justice, and the American way, but it's also you know, Harry doing all the things he did and being a mensch, <laughs> and Marilyn being this huge superstar and having a really sad, hard life, and Jerry and Joe drawing Superman and getting screwed out of it the American way. I see. You sort of tied it all together there. We did. Um, <laughs> this is not about your book. This is a side story. But <laughs> I discovered after many years of living in Stamford, Connecticut, that my neighbor a block away is Harry Connick Jr., who at the time was just in Independence Day, and he was a huge star, and his songs were playing on the radio, and um, and I remember, and he we met because I was also a musician. We were hanging out in his house, and I remember he's leaning back in an office chair, tossing a Nerf football like this, and he goes, God damn it, it just feels like I'm never going to make it. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? You're world famous. You, you sell millions of albums. And he's like, 17 million albums. Do you know how many Madonna has sold? Right. It's never enough. It's never <laughs> enough. Yeah. It's never enough. And it makes me wonder, when I put myself in the shoes of Bob Fosse or Harry um, or Warner Brothers, you know, is, is there a point where... Uh, not because of public pressure, but because it's the right thing to do. You break down and you say, okay, I'm going to cut you in on some of this. And, and by the way, the producers of A Chorus Line did yes, they ultimately did. give... Michael Bennett. That was Michael Bennett. Thing. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. So it is a question. How much is, is enough? All right. So I back to your book. In contract, I think the good thing to put in contract, at least I put in my contract, in, a, in the event of a huge success... <laughs> because sometimes you don't know, and if it's not successful, that's fine. Nobody's going to say another word. But in yeah. the event of huge success, like a chorus line or Superman, there should be that in there. There should be. There should be a writer. Yeah. You know, there should be. You should. They should have said, yes, you can have exclusive rights up to a billion dollars. <laughs> that's then why we you get, get a lawyer to look at your contract. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we get a half a percent. Okay. So the book came out in February. What happened? Phone ringing off the hook. Uh, Katie Couric wants to talk to you. What, what was the Oprah Book Club? Not yet. 
We, we would like to, to see it as a limited series, if anyone Ooh. knows someone. Somebody was interested. Um, we're, we're, talk, we're taking meetings. Right. <laughs> were there reviews? Oh, yeah. We're in the Times and uh, the Washington Post. What did they say? They loved it. Nice. Yeah, we got really good reviews all over the place. It's got really good reviews on Amazon. Yes. Okay, and then at some point, they asked you to record the audiobook version. What famous actor did you get for that? Me? Ronnie <laughs> Siegler. <laughs> it was, you did it right back there. Is it this yeah. way? This way, right? That way, that, yeah. That way. That, that way. way. That way. Yeah. Um, no, it was terrific. I loved it. I mean, I've... I, I had recorded one other audiobook before, but this was very different. And, and it was hard. Sometimes I was giggling, <laughs> or it, was, it moved me because I'm reading about my family. Yeah. It was intense. I, I've uh, had to record a couple of my books as audiobooks, and typically there's an engineer, right, listening, or a producer listening yes. to you. And, you know, it's really, when in life do you read 600 pages? Like, <laughs> No, never. It's really hard. It's a hard job. It is so hard. And I would I would be reading along, and then the producer would beep in on the intercom and say, David, did you mean to say that? Say what? That, you know, climate change is the foundational, uh, foundational, you know, orthogonal muskrat frog, or, you know, whatever. And I'm like, <laughs> what? And, you know, your brain, the, the words cease to become words. It, it just becomes it's long, yeah. gibberish. And they, have you ever looked at a word long enough that yeah, it ceases it to have any sense. meaning? It just looks like a strange bunch of symbols. Well, when I did my first, I did my two, uh, other books, audio book, um, the first day I went to record, it was my first book, um, I asked the producer what time we were breaking for lunch because I wanted to meet a friend who lived in the Union Square neighborhood. And he said, oh, no, no, you're not allowed out for lunch. This is really hard. And when people go, sometimes they don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> so I was captive for like eight hours. And it's hard. It's really hard. I did good, except for the German words. I had to go back and do the German words. I was words. Googling them all. <laughs> she was like to writing out the pronunciation for me, but I didn't get it right. I had so... I had to go back in and do the German. It's amazing. I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I find it amazing the mispronunciations that they let they let yeah. slip by. All bite. Some James Franco I think said uh, all bite instead of all be it. Uh -oh. oh my god. Yeah. Like nobody catches this. Yeah, anyway. That's bad. Um, so a limited series and and then what? Is there is there a sequel? Is there a collaboration? Are we going to do your grandfather's story? I already did my grandfather's she, she story. She already did. Oh, my you first, did? Yeah, my first book was called Five Finger Discount, A Crooked Family History. And it was about all the criminals in my family. It was made into a PBS documentary. And it was a bestseller. That was Where have I been? I don't know where you've been. <laughs> I've been hiding under a rock. But um, yeah, so that was my first book. And so this was similar in a way. It wasn't my family. You know, I wrote three memoirs and this was my first non-memoir. And so I was writing about someone else's family. She you know. ran out of family. I ran out of stories, basically. <laughs> I have to go rob a bank, you know, to get my next book. But uh, yeah, so that's how I got involved with Bonnie. But Bonnie, you're officially a graphic designer. And unofficially. Oh, okay. <laughs> and unofficially. Aren't you supposed to be satisfying your clients during this writing period? Yeah, I worked the whole time. I worked all through it. Yeah? Yeah. And. This was like was almost like a hobby. I mean, it was so amazing. Ancestry.com and dealing with the museums and talking to relatives I had never met before. It was amazing. It was all I wanted to be doing. And were husband Jeff and your, your boys equally enthused about this project? Absolutely, no. Because, really? Well, we were learning about our family. I mean, her, son, family. her son came with us to Berlin. Yeah, oh, Oscar really? came yeah. to Berlin. Oh, he us. did? Yes. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> okay. It was fantastic to, to see it through his eyes, watch him learning all this stuff. It was amazing. Right. So no reconceptions along the way, no excising, other than the one example you gave of this succession, this section needs some lightning. There was no, this chapter should go here. We definitely took stuff out, you know. You, you have some fat, you have to cut it. It winds up on the cutting room floor. I think we had, um, there's a, a part where um, 
when the war is over in 46, they lose Hitler as a villain for Superman, right? And so they're like, okay, who are we gonna fight now? And so they turn their attention to the KKK. And so we had a whole chapter on Superman fighting the KKK. It's really amazing material. There's been books written about it already, but um, so I did a lot of research, Bonnie did some research, and I did this chapter, but it was too much. It was, we didn't need a whole chapter, so it got cut back to a couple paragraphs. So things like that. And you know. the Nazi Titanic. Haircut, <laughs> you get rid of haircut. All right, tell us about the Nazi Titanic. Okay, here's you the clearly piece. clearly want to. <laughs> this is another piece that fell on the cutting room floor because it just went too far afield. But Hitler want, loved Hollywood movies. He watched two movies, that he screened two Hollywood movies every day. Um, and there's a book that will tell you what they were on each day. But while he was doing that, he decided that they needed to make the biggest movie ever made. And they decided to make it about the Titanic. And it was the most expensive movie made until the 80s. So it stood, the record held for 40 years. Oh my God. And in their version of the Titanic, which you can watch on YouTube, you just put in Nazi Titanic. It'll pop up. Um, they blame the British and the Americans for the ship sinking. <laughs> also capitalism is very much at fault. It's fascinating to it see what they can do, what, how they twist the story. But then the subsequent movies copied the Nazi Titanic, which if you've seen Night to Remember and James Cameron's Titanic, you'll recognize the scenes that were picked up, including in A Night to Remember, the sinking of the ship. They just took it from the Nazi Titanic. They didn't want to spend the money, and who was going to come after them for the film? Right. Oh, oh Wait, the Nazis the identical were footage? dead or in jail. The identical yeah. footage. Yeah. Oh, my it's God. It's fascinating. Yeah. Who brokered that deal? Harry Donenfeld? <laughs> <laughs> Did -dum -dum Thank you. I've been working on that for 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> Okay, yeah, so, uh, yeah, do you want to take some questions yeah, sure. from your, from, sure, from your questions. fans? Hello, everybody. If you have a question for Helene or Bonnie, please come to the microphone right over here. That way, those people watching the recording of this will be able to hear your question. Oh. You know what I hated about that Coast Guard guy's report on the search for the Titanic sub? What? He didn't repeat the questions. Yeah, you're right. Basic newbie error yeah, when you're yeah. doing a you press conference because do. only he was mic'd. And so he said, I will take questions at this time. Okay. Right. So no, okay. sir. Next question. Right, right, right. You can't hear it. Hi. Hi. Mine is not as much of a question as a moment of gratitude. I thought it was a great book. And so for those who are, haven't read it yet, it's being uh, mischaracterized, I think, in this session. It was a wonderful book. You present some very serious material in a, in a very um, readable way that maybe some of the younger folk don't really always know about the Holocaust. And the level of detail and like the visceral feeling about all the characters and how you tell each of their American stories and weave them together is really wonderful. And I was floored by the amount of research that you did. I will say that never before have I wanted to read all the notes, the source material. Right, right. It was really thank incredible. You. So thank you very much. It was a joy. Thank, thank you. We, we only paid her $100 to say that. So. What, do, you, do you authors feel that we've mischaracterized the book? No. No. Next Didn't question. she just say we've mischaracterized <laughs> it? She, I, meaning I've mischaracterized it, evidently. <laughs> I don't know. What? I think she's talking about the Harry Donenfeld situation. Okay, oh. Arlen, come on, give us a question. Okay. This message, a uh, message, a no. question for Bonnie. Yes. How did Harry exactly get your family out of Germany, and how difficult was it at that time to get Jews out of Germany? Was it a question just of money, connections, or both, or whatever? Yeah, it was everything, but you needed to have an American who signed for you and said, if you run into trouble and don't have any money as an, as an immigrant, I'll take care of it so that you wouldn't become a ward of the government. That was basically it. And the person who sponsored had to submit like two tax returns. Like there were 20 different pieces of paper they needed to submit. So my cousin Faye went to Harry at, told him what she needed, and then went back and picked up the documents. And it wasn't just for her grandfather, it was for his sister and his, her family as well. So he sponsored two, two families. So. And, and how did he know to sponsor them? Because my cousin Faye 
went to Harry and said, my cousin is in, stuck in Berlin with a wife and child and his sister and her family. She told him the whole story, and Harry agreed to do it. Harry also had a foundation and supported a lot of Jewish causes, so it, it fit in that he would do something like that, which, which actually cost him nothing. Yeah. Um, cost but, him nothing? Well, well, no, because he just had just to sign share paper. Oh, gotcha. You're just signing something. But my grandfather, when I was young, younger, um, I worked at MTV, and my grandfather was like, oh, good, you work on, in TV. Now you can make a movie about my life. Um, not the right kind of TV, but um, <laughs> he wanted it to be called The Signature, because to him, the signature saved his life and everyone's life, wow. my life. Wow. I think Arlen had a follow-up. Yes. I just wanted to add one last thing, David, to clarify. Back in those days in publishing, getting paid, you signed over your rights. It was implicit just getting published. So if you were getting paid for your art, your comics to be published, you were signing away the rights by getting paid. And that's the way business was done back then to all the young creators, except those like Bob Kane, who had a lawyer father who, you know, warned him oh. against this. But most of those young comic artists, they didn't. Yeah. Guys like Jack Kirby and, you know, the other greats of that era. But other Jews like Will Eisner were savvy and maintained the rights. But most of the young artists signed away their rights when they got published. Thank and, you. And how, how do you know so much? He's a comic He's a, historian. I'm a historian. Really? Yeah. yeah. A comic we'll historian? Talk later. Arlen Schumer. He's Can awesome. I come over to your attic sometime? Awesome. <laughs> I, you know, I lectured here last summer on uh, Kurt Swan, the great Superman artist who lived here in Westport. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. How's that we'll for full circle? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Arlen. All right. Full Hi. disclosure, I'm married to Helene's cousin. <laughs> not I, biased at all. So we didn't need to pay you, that's what you're saying. <laughs> not at all, not at all. This book is amazing. Just to follow up on the comment about the notes, when you read the notes, you feel like you're having a conversation at their kitchen table about the creative process that went into pulling all these facts together. It is, it is such a vivid read, the notes themselves. But uh, I had a question that I've been meaning to ask you, Bonnie, for a while. Um, in, the, in the book that describes Billy Wilder not having much money as, as a young man and, and going into the Romanisha's cafe and reading the paper all day and, and sort of eating that soft-boiled egg for as long as he could and being accepted in this culturally vibrant city that turned instantly on Kristallnacht, on the Jewish people there who were contributing to that culture. Um, what, what struck me towards the end of the book was you said that your grandfather or you guys said that your grandfather always considered himself uh, a Berliner. And I'm just curious, when you were there in that place where he found love and was venturing in his adult, into his adult life, but that, that upended his life, how do you feel about being in Berlin and what does, what does that do for you? <laughs> yeah, I really didn't like being in Berlin, um, in Germany in general. The language scares me. I mean, I really associate it with World War II films, to be perfectly honest, so it just weighs really heavily on me. But it is true that he thought he was, he was more German than Jewish. He was a German first. His father had fought in the world, First World War. He was very proud to be a German, and his country turned on him. And why did he hate the Kennedy speech so much? <laughs> he, being Ein Berliner, just, I am a jelly he, donut. He wasn't a Berliner, and he said it wrong. Yeah, yeah. He, what he said was, I am a jelly donut. Ich bin ein Berliner. And you're supposed right. to say, ich bin Berliner, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, it, that was also towards the end of his life, and he was like, he just, it was like Kennedy made the speech the day before. You know, he just got all worked up about it. Oh, I see, I see. But he, he, was a, he was more of a Berliner than a, a German, even, because yes. being a Berliner is almost like being a New Yorker. Yes. You know? You're an American, but you're really kind of a New Yorker. Yeah. You know? So yeah. it was a similar situation. Hi. Hi. I have a general Holocaust question. I know, like, Freud and uh, maybe Shlomo Karlbach's father, because I just saw a movie on him, were, uh, deport were deported, possibly, from Germany. And then in this case, I could be wrong, but in this case, there were sponsorships outside by reaching out from Germany to... America. My question is, you may not know the answer, uh, but according to the Holocaust Museum or the, the Museum of Jewish History in, in Battery Park area, what percentage of uh, Jews from other countries 
you know, had people, had resources, had connections in terms of family reaching out. Um, just because my family is from uh, Slovakia, like my whatever, my my grandparents. I'm just nervous public speaking. No, it's okay. Don't I have worry. No, there's no stake in this question. You're, you're in a safe spot. <laughs> Thank so you. Want, <laughs> Thank you. But my question is, I guess, if you go to one of those museums, what percentage of Jewish people um, reached out to get saved in that way? And was it primarily from Germany? Like, I know in Berlin, like, there was sort of, I don't know, the reputation is that more educated or even more successful Jewish people, so maybe they would have more connections to the United States. But I guess, do you know anything about other countries and what percentage of those Jews had were able to save themselves by reaching right. into America? Well, I think it was, you know, it, it didn't happen overnight, right? Uh, Hitler came in in, like, 33, and things got really bad in 38. But they were getting bad over that time. So I think some people saw the writing on the wall, like Billy Wilder left fairly early. Um, Marlena Dietrich left early. A lot of people left early. Um, but people like um, her family, you know, her, like she said, her uh, great, great, wait, was it great, great grandfather fought in World War I. Um, you know, they felt like they were safe. You know, I'm a German. They're not going to bother me. I fought for this country. They're not going to do anything to me. And so I think the more money you had, the more confident you were that you were going to be okay. You know what I mean? And so those people tended to stay. And by the time they figured out that they needed to leave, it was too late. Yeah, money, I know from Maus, I know Spiegelman has spoken here. I miss that. But yeah, there's a there's a comic uh, uh, page in that book that's perfect. There was like money couldn't do anything. It's right. like the father was like ripping his hair out. Yeah. But um, yeah, I just. But I think and it was rolling. You know what I mean? You know they invaded Poland and then Hungary didn't happen until what 44, right? You know I mean so each country, you know, people felt like well I'll be safe, I'll be safe, and then it got worse and worse, and people got trapped, and then after the war started, I mean if you were from Germany, you couldn't come. You know, you, whether you were Jew or non-Jew, you weren't going to come. You were German. You weren't allowed in the country. So past 41, it was over. And you didn't need a sponsor in the beginning. If you decided to leave in 33, 34, 35, you could get out. It wasn't until later that you absolutely couldn't get out without a sponsor. And there was nowhere to go. You know, you couldn't get in anywhere. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a matter of not being able to leave. You know, you could leave, but where would you, where would you go? And people started going to Shanghai. They went to Cuba. Um, South America. South America. You know, Amer America really kind of had a pretty tight quota. They weren't letting a lot of people in, so. But they didn't even fill their quota that they did have. Oh. Yeah. The American so, way. <laughs> since, since Sandy started the conversation, uh, I'm the cousin. That's the cousin. That's and, my cousin. Um, yeah. So uh, you talked about a lot of the major characters uh, in this, but there were also a lot of minor characters and who in particular, uh, as a minor character, really touched you, or who did you identify well, with? Well, you want me to? Well, we might have different we might people. Both. Yeah, well, my favorite, I think, was... Um, uh, Anne Ushi? Ushi, yeah, Ushi. So Ushi was um, her aunt. Um, she was the sister of her grandmother, okay? She was a teenager at the time that they left, and she wanted to leave, but her parents were like, no, it'll be okay, we're gonna stay here. And so she had to hide out in Berlin through the whole war. They called them submarines. Um, people who were Jewish who just Below avoided the, surface. the Nazis, you know, every day. Um, so Ushi is sort of this superhero to me. Um, she not only survived and came to America, but once she got to America, she was one of those people who helped everybody. She actually helped one of her friends survive in, um, in Nazi Germany. She helped her escape. Um, so it's just... And she, and she moved around because she couldn't stay in one place very long. And everywhere she went, she carried a typewriter, which was against the law for Jews. She carried it all through every hiding place she went to and brought it over on the boat when she finally came to America. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so and oh, she, Jews she was, couldn't have radios or typewriters, anything. And we, we, she wasn't going to be part of the book. We didn't really put her in the, you know, when I was plotting it out originally. But the more we found out about her from her family, um, I was like, she's got to be in there. And, and my aunt, she, I knew her my whole life, but I never knew any of these stories. I can't encourage you to talk to your older relatives yeah. enough because I so regret that I sat at, you know, Passover seders with these people and didn't ever ask them. So I don't know if they would have told me because my grandfather told a lot of stories, but they were only the positive stories. He never told me the bad stories. We found the bad stories. I think if you ask, you know, sometimes people will just tell you. So please ask. <laughs>
Hi, I just have a comment. Um, I want to say thank you for the book. Sorry. Bring it down, bring it down. Better? Yeah. Better, okay. Um, thank you for the book because I saw The American Way, I saw Marilyn Monroe, I saw Superman, I was like, wow. <laughs> and I am a Holocaust educator, I'm a child of survivors, and I you know, spent eight years at Yad Vashem at summer seminars. And um, they had students who did posters and two of the posters, one was Bambi, and in the background was Auschwitz, a picture of the, the, the men sleeping in the barracks. And another one was Gone with the Wind, and another similar type of picture that I actually took pictures of the pictures because they didn't send, they didn't do any posters. It was a student project, and I still have it. I will never forget it. So I want to say thank you because what you've done is, like you said, you're opening it up to the ordinary person of interest to say, what is this about? So it's like, what's going on in the world when the Holocaust was happening? So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, do, do these folks have an opportunity to get signed copies while they're here? They do indeed. I was just about to say that, David. Oh, Absolutely. Great minds. Great. First, I'd like to thank both Bonnie and Helene and David for coming in tonight. I want to thank everybody here in the, the library for coming in tonight. I would also like to say that if you want to learn more about our Fairfield County Holocaust history, please check out the first Fairfield County Holocaust Resource Center opening in September. And you can look at that from the Jewish Federation website. So thank you all. We do have copies of the book that will be signed for you if you'd like to uh, just create a line over here. And thank you both so much for writing this amazing book. Thank, thank you. you. Beautiful, Thanks for having beautiful us. book. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.